that there's little doubt that the last 18 months in Scotland will be poured over by academics, talked about for generations and studied by scholars for decades to come. Full impact of those months with the referendum and general election result will only become clear with context and time and influenced by events yet to happen. I went out this week to the home of Scotland's leading historian, Professor Sir Tom Devine, to get his take on not just the immediate past, but the road which led us here. Tom Devine, thanks very much for in inviting us into your book-lined study uh, here <laughs> in deepest, darkest Lanarkshire. Um, I was reminded, actually, of when I think we met before, I mean, we met su subsequently, but possibly the first time, was at the launch of your book, uh, The Scottish Nation, in, I think, 1999, Donald Dewar presiding. Yes. Um, and that, for you, a, has been a fantastic uh, book opening you up to lots of new readers, I, I expect. It's been well, a I, great that, 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 that's, sale. It's very kind of you to say that, Bill. I mean, obviously, what I tried to do in that book was to, you know, make it acceptable to my peers, you know, the academic community, but at the same time um, try and showcase what had been a, a, a revolution in Scottish historiography to the people. In other words, it was meant to be accessible. Um, and uh, of course, the big advantage was it was published more or less at the same time as the opening of the Parliament. Well, it was extraordinary that it, it coincided with that, and there was a sense then that things had changed a lot Correct. in Scotland. Yes, and it people was... wanted to know why, and I think that's the reason why it, you know, the, the publishers always say for two weeks, only two weeks, by the way, it outsold Harry Potter <laughs> in in Scotland. Um, but uh, I've just got I've just got the recent sales figures for it, and it's amazing to think. How many years ago is that from 1999? 16 years ago. Right. Well, the, the most recent sales figures for the last six months of last year was about 4,500 were sold. Well, that's that's extraordinary that it's still selling in. But I exactly. wonder if you feel the need really to go back to that and revise it in, this, in the light of how much has yeah. changed. Well, what I, how would you characterise that change since the start of a Scottish Parliament, the first Scottish Parliament for nearly 300 years, and now when we've got a plurality of SNP MPs, I mean, 56 out of 59 at Westminster. Well, I, I would characterise it in, in this way, Bill, that, that um, it's, you know, there's been revolutions, if you like, in Scottish history since uh, the 18th century, the Industrial Revolution, the Enlightenment, our penetration of empire, etc. But politically, this period that you've identified stands out as distinctive. I would never use the word unique, but certainly in terms of the speed of political change and not only its ramifications for the Scottish people, but its ramifications for the UK. You know, still one of the most powerful states in the world. It has been remarkable. And what do you think are the forces then at work, at play, that, that have changed Scotland's politics so much? Well, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the Parliament uh, theoretically, from the standpoint of the Labour Party, it was intended to, I mean, let's, let's give credit when it's due, to democratise Scotland to a degree within the UK and give, give some degree of devolution, but also, you know, kill the SNP fox. And everybody knows the extraordinary statement by George Robertson about um, it would kill nationalism stone dead. Uh, so I think the big question is, um, and this is post Thatcher, I argue in one, one of my other volumes that Thatcher is indeed the mother of the Scottish Parliament, but she doesn't. She didn't cause recent events. That her influence was directly on the creation of the Scottish Parliament. She gave spine and steel to a revived devolutionary movement. So the big historical question is, how do we explain how we get to where we are now, from 1999, and as I say, a situation which was, at least by its uh, begetters, by those who had created the Scottish Parliament, was intended to settle the Scottish question for a very, very long time. So what do you think happened? Because the initial first couple of parliaments uh, after its, its reintroduction, the Parliament's reintroduction, mm -hmm. were a sort of rainbow parliament of various um, political uh, colours. Yeah. Um, but it was dominated as expected by Labour. What right. changed, do you think? Uh, well, it was almost as if uh, in that first re uh, period that the Scots were trying everything. First of all, they tried the coalition, then there was the rainbow element came in. But each of those parliaments, although some you know very useful things were achieved, were, in terms of governance at least, rel relatively mediocre. 
it looked as if, um, how would you put it, that devolution was a pretty damp squib. And then there was the horror of the Parliament building and its exploding costs, etc., etc. Um, so I think things started to happen round about uh, the first SNP minority government, 2006, 2007, that particular period. I remember three months after the, the SNP decided to go into a minority administration, I was giving a lecture to senior civil servants at the away weekend near Edinburgh, uh, which I usually did, and then I would join a table for dinner after it. And six of the individuals round the table were um, uh, English. And they were all because the UK civil service is unitary. And I simply asked them the question, leaving aside your own political leanings and off the record, how did the present lot do compared to the last lot administratively? And they all said that they were much more effective. So I think that the, the first thing that happened was the first administration, despite the fact that it was a minority administration, had showed its, if you like, its metal for governance. Rightly or wrongly, the Scottish people liked what they were doing, and it contrasted vi vividly with the semi-mediocrity of what had gone before. So that was, the, that was the first stage, but it was only the first stage. It didn't necessarily mean that we got from that point inevitably and predictably to a referendum. No, but um, the uh, election of a majority SNP yeah. government in 2011 inevitably did lead, lead to the Correct. referendum. We'll get on to the referendum in a moment, yeah. but what, what do you think went wrong for Labour uh, over those years? Because in 2010, remember, their MPs were returned um, and none of them was kicked out. So uh, in 2010, Labour still seemed to have a stranglehold on, on the, the Scottish uh, political scene, at least as far as Westminster is concerned. Yeah, I mean, th th that's in a sense, you're absolutely right about that, but in a sense that was, was mi 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 misled the Labour Party. Um, they still thought they were in control because the old structure established in 16, uh, since 1999 of the Scots voting one way in Holyrood and voting another way in Westminster was still intact. But unfortunately for Labour, as we look back with the historian's gift of hindsight, it was not. I would actually go as far back as possibly the late 70s, early 80s of the previous century to understand what had happened to this party which had dominated not simply Scottish politics but Scottish life, including the local uh, community uh, base, uh, for so long. Um, the, the phrase I use is that Labour over a period had been hollowed out uh, it was really happening to a large extent underneath the surface. It wasn't really very visible. And one of the explanations why we got this Gotadamarong, this extraordinary disaster at the recent general election, is I liken it to a large nut whose innards had been extracted over time. So the, all, all that is left is the shell, and therefore the shell easily cracks when it comes under pressure. So if you go back to my original statement about the 70s and 80s, the, some of the great pillars of Labour dominance were in decay by that time. For example, the end of manufacturing industry as we knew it, with trade unionism attached, was in massive decline. Secondly, their fiefdoms in the council housing estates were being affected by right to buy. And then in the late um, uh, uh, 20th century, Blairism and new Labour coming in, a lot of people didn't like that. Although they emphasised the word at this stage, Labour was in partial decline. It was not yet facing destruction. That came later for other reasons. So if I divide my analysis up to before and after the SNP minority government of 2007, at the same time as this was going on, the SNP were getting stronger. Why? They were getting essentially stronger because there had been major um, reforms made uh, to their administrative um, structure. They were a much more coherent party, um, they were much more effectively governed uh, by this stage and of course they had Salmond at the helm for much of the period of the, 19, of the 1990s. Um, and then the, 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 the thing which was uh, vital to the SNP, because if this hadn't happened they would still in my view be a my minority party, um, what happened was the Scottish Parliament. You see the SNP vote if you look at it in the 1990s, you know, it could sometimes go up to about 25 to 30% of the vote, but it hardly any seats in Westminster elections because the vote was evenly spread. So they often came second 
but more often they were not victorious. What happened was the Scottish Parliament gave them the opportunity for power because in addition to first past the post, you know, the constituency system, there was the list system. And if you look at the first parliamentary elections uh, for the Scottish Parliament, those SNP MPs who were returned were either mainly or exclusively list. And it was from that platform, the platform of the Scottish Parliament, created ironically by Labour, and one recent senior Labour former um, Member of Parliament has described it as we erected our own scaffold, which in a sense you could say they did. Um, they utilised very effectively the Scottish Parliament to demonstrate that administrative, administrative capacities in 2000, 2007 and 2011, at the same time that for other reasons, which I can come to uh, in a few moments if you wish, for other reasons, the decay of the Labour Party was accelerating. Well, just let's go to 2011 then and the SNP majority. They had promised a referendum, so they had to deliver. But it was to be a very long referendum campaign. That was how, a major, effective, that was well, a major, how effective do you think that was? Well, I mean, that was a major mistake by Cameron, in my view. I don't know if he thought, having decided that he had his way over the two-question issue, when so many people, for example, who would have gone for devolution max, decided that they had been disenfranchised. I mean, this includes me, by the way, um, and therefore decided to vote yes. Um, so he had that victory, but um, the, um, the SNP position on this was very astute because if that had taken place within a few months of the agreement, the Edinburgh Agreement, if you will, uh, then uh, there would have been a crushing victory, in my view, for no. So the SNP were wise to put it, put it off as long as they could? Correct, and uh, Cameron et al. were um, uh, proven to be wrong in allowing them to so do. It did, you did take a while yourself to come out for yes, though, didn't you? Yeah, because, um, I mean, one of the things that uh, annoyed me in uh, the, the recent press release about uh, so-called top Catholics in Britain um, was I was described as uh, a nationalist. Uh, I'm not a nationalist. I, I voted the way I did because I thought it was best for my country. Um, and I don't belong to the SNP or anything like that. But I think there's so many people in my position who would have gone for what was then the favoured option of enhanced evolution. But um, that wasn't to be... So it was really very much a, 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 not a last minute decision, but it, it involved a lot of emotional and intellectual contortions. Well, that um, that bid to get a yes vote failed narrowly, mm, yeah. or 55 to, to, to 45 roughly. Yeah. Um, what do you think happened between September the 18th and now to see this huge upsurge in the SNP support, a party support rather than a, a proposition. It wasn't just support okay, for, for the yes proposition. Right. Well, Why the first, do you think the, the, the SNP point benefited is, so much? First point is, as I said earlier, Labour had been in a long-term decline, but a lot of it was below the radar, under the surface. The second thing was the politicisation of many Scots, especially in relation to what I call identity politics, rather than the old politics of class, etc. I mean, what you got in Scotland, in fact, was a fusion of identity politics and, you know, politics related to an aspiration for social justice, which you could see as a, to some extent, a class-based uh, conception. And then the third thing, of course, was the great betrayal. The Labour Party standing shoulder to shoulder with the dreaded Tories, mm. still a toxic brand uh, in Scotland uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the no campaign side. Mm. But even worse than that was, and I think this was the real watershed point, when um, a Tory minister came north. And, you know, Osborne is the, almost the very physical incarnation of Toryism, you know, by way of his education and his upbringing and his, uh, his, his wealth, etc. And saying to the Scots that under no circumstances could they join a currency union if they voted to be independent. Now, that had two crushing effects, in my view. One, it demonstrated that the notion the Scots had always had that the union was a partnership was immediately and instantaneously demolished. But even worse than that, for those who were aware, and this was certainly mentioned in some of the press, Ireland and the free, freed colonies of the 60s and 70s were allowed a currency union. And here was 
a partner of Scotland. Uh, we had been with them through two major world wars and of course the uh, experience of building an empire together in the 18th and 19th centuries and they weren't even prepared to lift a finger, the British government, uh, to give a helping hand if there had been a, a vote, especially a, a yes vote, especially since the, the SNP position was to minimise the extent of the disruption. You know, the so-called social union, the Queen being retained, still going to be in NATO, etc. No barriers at the frontiers, etc., etc. And I think the this term that was used at the time, uh, Bill, of project fear, uh, was uh, absolutely accurate. So, do you, was there a sense then? Do you think in people saying, "Well, we are not, we are not afraid. We're we're not feared." Well, I think that the other thing was that uh, the vote, as you say, was a clear victory for for no, and therefore in the general election, you know, there was it wasn't the same zero sum game. Um, in any sense. There was no threat, no, no real risk. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the commentators were saying, well, the SNP could actually be a supportive element in a progressive Labour government, etc., in Westminster. So there was really nothing to lose. And I think there was a desire to give Labour a really good doing and at the same time uh, promote uh, a, a party or at least a point of view which seemed to be winning over a lot of people, especially former Labour voters during the campaign. I think the politicisation of the campaign was extremely important. It was just, in a sense, very bad luck for Labour that the general election followed soon after the referendum experience. If, I, you know, if it had been a year down the road, I just wonder whether it would have been of the same cataclysm for the Labour Party. So do you think this, this result is a freak? Or do you think some people take this view that actually Scotland has moved through phases and that in the 1950s it was a majority Tory voting yeah, yes. country? And that since then, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, it's been Labour voting, and now there's been this, this new seismic shift, and it will vote SNP for a while, for decades. Do you go along with that? Well, I mean, as I, it's become a cliche almost, I always keep saying, although I have departed now from this for some, some time, the future is not my <laughs> period. Um, but, the, um, but the point is this that um, I, I don't think the Labour Party's finished, um, but I think a, sin, a, a sine qua non, an absolutely fundamental uh, basis for recovery is going to be some kind of independent Labour Party. Because, you see, the, 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 the British Labour Party writ large has got to move in a certain direction if it, because of the electoral values in England if it's going to ever take government again in, in Westminster. And that won't be good for Scottish Labour. So I think there's got to be perhaps an affiliation between the two. The other thing is, you know, I said in a book I've just finished, this could possibly be, we don't know, because the future, as I say, is speculative. This could be the high water mark for the SNP. I mean, they can't do any better than they have been doing. Barely. Exactly. I mean, there could be another wipeout in, nine, in uh, 2016. And therefore, you know, it's, you know, like Labour used to be, and the Tories were for a period as well, if you're in hegemony, you're vulnerable to assault um, because you are the dominant party. Uh, or you belong to the dominant party. And a, a lot of SNP policies will come in for much more rigorous assessment and evaluation over the coming uh, months and years. You mentioned Ireland uh, there, and I wanted to just ask a couple of questions about what's been one of your main um, points of research, yeah. which is the Irish diaspora, but also the Scottish diaspora, mm. and, and the Irish in Scotland. Yes. I wonder what you make of um, research just after the referendum that seemed to suggest that the uh, Catholic community in mm. Scotland seems to be more prone to voting nationalists, voting for independence. What do you make of that? Because I think there's been a change in, oh, yes. in that community. It's a huge there? change. I mean, as late as the 60s, 70s, maybe even into the early 80s, um, the normal Catholic position in the west of Scotland was that the SNP was a Protestant and perhaps even an anti-Catholic party. And so there's been a, a huge shift there as well. And at the same time, from the development of the Irish Free State in 1922, on block before supporting, before that they supported the Liberals because of the Irish Home Rule uh, issue, on block they moved to what they thought was the Party of Social Justice uh, as a disadvantaged group, which was Labour. So Labour could always count on that bedrock vote, and that's gone. Because, as you say, if you look at religious groupings or non-religious groupings, Catholic, Protestant or Presbyterian, and people of no belief, 
even before the referendum, it was suggested and has shown that the likely Catholic vote for independence would be about 33-34%, much greater than the Kirk, which was about somewhere in the mid-twenties, and even greater for those of no faith. So that, that has been one part of the tsunami. That grouping, and I think the explanation for it is really twofold. One, they are now within the mainstream, that former disadvantaged group are now within the mainstream of Scottish society. They achieved broad occupational parity in the census of 1991, and that was firmly, even more firmly established at the census of 2001. But the other thing to remember is, to some extent, this is a statistical fluke, um, Bill, because, you see, the Church of Scotland membership is much older now than the Catholic Church membership. The Catholics have been more able to keep their younger people, although there's hemorrhaging going on there. And we know that people in their 20s and 30s were more likely to vote yes, whereas the membership of the Church of Scotland is heavily skewed to those above 50 and 55. Again, that cohort tends to be less, less seduced, uh, or was less seduced, uh, by the yes option. What about the Scottish diaspora and the rest of the world? What impact do you think they have had on recent Scottish history or events? Do you think they have any impact um, in the sense of what they want to see? Or is it just about the people people who are in Scotland at the moment? Brings but, us, of course, maybe to the to question, who are the Scots? I mean, the Scots yeah, are actually I mean, the people uh, who are living here at the yeah. I, I, would, I would be, I would, I mean, there's nobody serious, no serious research has been done on this, but I would, I would wager speculatively that if, uh, say, first-generation expatriate Scots, like let's keep it to them, uh, in England and elsewhere, had the vote, then there would there would be an independent Scotland today. Uh, because the other side of the coin is it's really quite interesting that um, there's over 440 first-generation English people in Scotland. They're well integrated into Scottish society, and many of them love Scotland. But we know from the analysis of the referendum results that that group voted overwhelmingly no. Um, so I think, I think that the SNP were absolutely right to limit the vote to those who are living in Scotland because it destroyed the argument that the SNP were into ethnic nationalism rather than civic nationalism. Can I put to you something I, I read this week? I think it was Kenneth Roy in this Scottish Review who was suggesting that the Scots seem quite prone to enthusiasm, a sort of crusading zeal. And he said that in, in his lifetime there had been three. One was the sort of Billy Graham crusades okay. in the 50s, 60s. Right. The second, and you'll laugh at this, is 1978 and the, the uh, Argentinian World yeah. Cup, which we were bound to win with Alan's Correct. army. And the third, he says, is this uh, enthusiasm for the SNP now. No, I, th I think um, to some extent Ken is, is betraying there, I think, his own particular political feelings. That's would be my view. You see, this, this, this is different from those. Uh, this, is, this, this cannot be dis dis dismissed simply as a, a blip because it has got structural forces which have led up to this current situation. And, of course, the other mythology, that might be one uh, urban myth which is developing, but a much more long-standing myth about Scottishness is we are a cautious people. So, I mean, wh wh where do you go on this? As, as an historian, I would say, looking back through to the 70s and the 80s, not that you could see this coming, but it has long distance roots. It's not a blip and it's not a one-off. But there's also been, during that period, almost an evangelical, if you go back to Billy Graham, uh, almost a cult-like attitude developing during the campaign in its later stages, especially among those movements outside the SNP. Now, whether that particular dynamic will simply self-destruct is perhaps a more pertinent question than, than Ken Roy's, um, because, the, um, uh, because uh, it's, it's been maintained with the onset of the general election, for how much further will that momentum uh, continue? What do you think when you look at that, when you look at some of the uh, people who are terribly enthusiastic about the cause and who accuse those who are not on board for it of being quislings or traitors? Well, I think, um, I think that's wrong to begin with. I mean, the, the, um, as I said, said to you before, I think the vast majority of Scots would have voted for um, 
uh, would have voted for enhanced devolution if that had been available on, on the ballot paper. I actually said to Alex Salmond during a debate I had with him at the Edinburgh International Book Festival that if I was in your position, I would have gone for the status quo or devil max as the questions. Bed the thing in and then go for the big one. Um, and in a sense, this is what's happening in reverse, <laughs> you know. Um, so, so the the uh, uh, so, so I think there's that that uh, that there's that aspect uh, there's that aspect to it. There is another myth that the that the actual engagement of the referendum campaign was all nice and harmonious. It was overwhelmingly, I think. It was a remarkable thing. I mean, the way that the overseas journalists used to talk about it. You know, they never see anything like this in their life in their home country. So it was a reality. But there was also some bad blood. And you know, families were split on on the issue as as, as well. So I hope that kind of thinking uh, rapidly evaporates, r rapidly disappears. Um, but the other aspect, remember, I mentioned to you that the SNP are ripe for uh, more thorough examination now than they have been in the past. That movement is also ripe for re-examination. I don't know how many Scots, especially those who are conservative with a small C, because I think Scotland still is a relatively small c conservative society, know that many of the anchors of that other momentum, you know, belong to quite far left groupings who are coming together uh, on, on, in, in this way. All power to their elbow, that's the, that was their cause. But at a time when they were, if you like, that, that element in Scottish society was almost politically irrelevant, they found this cause uh, to, to come together. We're nearly out of time, but I just wanted to, and, and sometimes bringing up quotes from the past is a bit invidious, but here's one from 2007 okay. uh, from you. You said, independence is more likely when, first of all, there's a left-wing Holyrood government meeting a right-wing UK government. Secondly, economic austerity. And third, if Labour, the big unionist party, loses Scotland. Now, all three of those have happened. Yeah. Is that, does that make independence inevitable? No, it, I mean, again, it's the problem about the inevitability aspect. I think more likely. I think independence is now more likely than it's ever been in Scottish history since 1707. Um, because that, that quotation you gave me, um, it's, uh, it, you describe it almost as the, as the perfect storm uh, for those who wish. But it's even, it's even more so than that, because um, uh, not many commentators have stressed the significance of the Conservative victory um, uh, very recently. Um, a, cl a clear but small majority and a very, a very right-wing political portfolio, uh, almost, and in some, in some cases, even more than that of Thatcherism in the 70s and 80s. Um, depending how Cameron and Al play this, that could be the final um, breaking point of the union. Because it's not simply the left-wing uh, uh, the left-wing government, uh, SNP uh, government in Edinburgh, they've now got a tranche of MPs in the um, uh, in the House of Commons. They wiped out Scottish Labour um, emphatically uh, in that particular arena. However, they are now facing um, what I think perhaps is a conflict they've been looking forward to, relishing almost a rightist Conservative government directly in opposition to an SNP uh, uh, Scottish majority. All right. And you've, you've frequently said the future's not your business, um, but would you care to... In all my to, period. All right, well, yeah. <laughs> would you care to make a, a forecast of any sort as to when independence might happen or how? No, because uh, I really couldn't do that. Too, I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't dip out of it, except for the fact that there are now so many variables in the mix. All I can say is the danger to the union is much more acute than it even was in the days before the referendum on Scottish independence. Professor Sir Tom Devine, thanks very much. Thank you.